Hello, Rebel G Man 4D. This is your recap for the week. I am Chug Man Milk. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is going to be a solo show for me today because uh, I have to do something later on. So I kind of had to record this kind of quick and, and hurriedly. And also, um, yeah, I just didn't, just didn't get the chance to really ask around. Don't worry. Uh, I did ask Riff, but unfortunately he was busy this week, and that's a shame because some very exciting thing <laughs> happened in his game between him and the Dark Elves. Uh, nevertheless, we will be back with a co-host next week. Uh, if Riff can't join us, I'll ask around. We might have to start doing repeats if no one else is up and ready to also be a co-caster. But, you know, let's get this started. We have the first game being the 1-0 victory of the Sun-Baked Sea Guard. That's Gunnerside's High Elves versus GFI Joe's Four Throttle Rotters. Um, not a shocking, not a shocking scoreline because Elves on a good day can always shut out Nurgle, especially this sort of Nurgle that is still kind of struggling for uh, garden and skills that can really lean on Elves. And probably will struggle to have that for a good season or two. But of course, the uh, statistics kind of tell the story of the Nurgle hit, hit, hit. And the uh, High Elves didn't do very much of that. Look at the statistics. Yep, four KOs inflicted, two injuries inflicted. So, Nurgle played their game. High Elves seem to have played their game. Three passes, three catches. Uh, always a bit of a tough possibility. Because of how good Nurgle are at stopping High Elves from doing the passing play. Um, they got enough of the band to pass us off. 15 blocks succeeded is pretty funny, but... Uh, elves knew that their Elf game was definitely stronger than anything else and managed to play it therefore kind of perfectly perfectly so yep well done going aside that takes you now up to a uh, top four wins I believe uh, kind of separating from the head of the pack or separating at the head of the pack to be a real contender for the playoffs phases for the main uh, main playoffs next game is the Glart Deference Junior that's my underworld versus the Nurgle of Helgen. Uh, this game, obviously, it's my game, so I know a lot about it. Again, what happened to Nurgle was that their offense kind of fell apart and he couldn't get past the uh, touchdown line to score, which is a very, very common problem of Nurgle. Uh, they're just really damn slow. Sort of like, um, sort of like, in a way, a bit faster than dwarves, but dwarves can be given like five turns to score, but not even eight turns. And if things don't go their way, it, they can absolutely fall apart. And what it took for my underworld was essentially corpses in the way to stop him from doing anything apart from handoffs in tackle zones, I believe it was. Can't remember the game entirely, but it was definitely he had to roll way too many dice to get that touchdown, and it worked out for me this time. Then my touchdown that I scored was really, really hard to score. Don't, don't get me wrong. But the lack of tackle on the team meant the Blodge kind of held up for a turn or two more than, than was good enough for the Nurgle. When he finally got him down, he only really had one piece to uh, really go get him. So there wasn't sort of a... a uh, a receiver. There wasn't a, a piece that could then join the sacker and then get the ball back. There was no recovery in that sense. Um, Skull out and Glart meant that I could get enough people back to not only clear the ball, but stun the person who had sacked him. Uh, I had about five or six bodies, I think, in the end screening off the ball, and it was as simple as waiting for turn 16 to score. So, very happy with the result. 2 1 1. Not bad for Underworld. Uh, commiserations to Helgen. Played a damn fine game. Uh, next game is a complete 
complete blowout, which is Skaven beating the poor Harkin team 4-1. This was a prediction I think me and Krepsilum essentially made. Although there's never a great matchup for the Halflings, uh, how fast the, the Skaven are just means they will go super, super turbo compared to um, Halflings. And if the Halflings make any single mistake whatsoever, they're just... The way they can be exploited and the way they can be torn apart, it's kind of in a way that's disproportionate to um, a lot of other teams. Because other teams at least might have, say, some tackle to run back and maybe get a gut runner if they had to move quite far and then didn't have enough space after the sack or the recovery to get out of range. They might have big guys who can lean on the Skaven and make things hard. The problem is, is that the trees are slow as hell, the players are slow as hell, and no one has tackle. So, I, this this is a very <laughs> expected scoreline for one. Not to mention that Yusarin got SPP for days in lots of other places. Three injuries, four KOs. Six passes, six catches. Yeah, insane SPP generation game. Uh, so, commiserations again to the Halflings. But this was probably their worst matchup, bar, say, Chorus. Next game was the 1 0 victory of uh, Plovak's Third Guardians, their Lizards, versus T-Cold's Norse to smash you to Um Two deaths for the, the Norse is horrific, and we'll get to that when we look at the teams. 18 armor breaks, uh, 7 KOs, 3 injuries inflicted from the 52 blocks, while 92 produced uh, 2 armor breaks and nothing. This this is probably as close as you can get to a dicing. Yeah, you know what? Well, a lot of people say that dicings, um, a lot of dicings don't happen as often as people think they do. A lot of people call everything that happens as kind of like bad, or the dice kind of go a bit someone against someone as a dicing. But T Cold legitimately has a case for saying he was dice in this game. Um, my heart goes out to T Cold. Commiserations again. Um, Plovak showing once again his strength as lizard coach, and I believe that now makes his record pretty, uh, pretty impressive for the game week. We also again leaderboards next week. We're going to start looking at leaderboards and say, okay, these start, these start to represent something. Uh, so look out for that game week. Next result was the 2 1 victory of the Camry versus the Pro Elves. So that's Masterful versus. Um, that's embarrassing. Name escapes me, name escapes me, name escapes me. Wheelie. Yeah, Wheelie. Um, 20, <laughs> 27 armor breaks is, is a lot. Uh, 8 injury, 8 KO, 4 injuries, a kill. Uh, yeah, the Camry pitch cleared the Pro Elves. Which is, uh, yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely, although you have the Mighty Blow, uh, I think, tackle. Yeah, Mighty Blow tackle. I'm not sure we've got piling on yet, but you have that Blitz that has Mighty Blow tackle. Although you have the Mighty Blow on the Tomb Guardians. Nevertheless, this is definitely hitting above the curve. Uh, this was... A very much kind of a freak game it looks like uh, because he <laughs> Master Ball wasn't getting the injuries when he played me as his Kemri and I have Stunty uh, and Seven Armor no he merely just killed the troll so that's a fantastic result for Master Ball who otherwise has had a pretty tough season these last few game weeks um, I believe that makes him 202 and definitely continues a bit of a hard season for Wheelie He'll be looking to bounce back next week. This is a this is a shock result. This one's a really shock result in the next game week, or this game week, which was uh, the Dark Elves, the Rambunctious Rebels, beat that horrific, scary uh, Chorf team four one. Now we, I think, and that we being Crepsum and I said, Dark Elves can definitely, you know, 
like a wizard and right like, circumstances turn what should be a kind of crushing matchup for them where they just die 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 into one where they can get 2-1 um or 3-1 quite easily they're not the fastest of elves but they can do it and what happened here looks to be uh <laughs> the dark elves actually pulled that off which is you know wraith guards i salute you we'll also talk about the teams because something really funny happened a little bit later but yeah, that, that is a stunning result for the for the Dark Elves. Um, even though 7 KOs and 4 injuries were inflicted, he managed to weather the storm entirely. Let's look at the wake up of KOs. Yeah, he got his KOs back mostly. So, assuming he had a babe. If he had one babe, he was slightly better than average with the KOs. So... You know that that is quite phenomenal, and I have to hats off to Wraithguard for getting that result. That was definitely something we didn't predict. Four one, two one. I could say maybe, but we all sort of said, "Oh well, you know, Rift Cannon will just destroy the Dark Elves, cas them to buggery and back." But in reality, four one. Yeah, who would have seen that coming? And the last game is three 0 it was a Necro mirror match. And it was Crepslim's Necro versus Matty's Necro. I.e. the Necro that still has all of its, you know, bells and whistles. And the Necro team that is looking very much like a Season 1 Necro team. Poor Matty, ever since losing his Agile War, um, has been a bit in the uh, bit in the doldrums. And the power of a 9-movement 4-round wolf in this game, uh, on the side of Crepslim, seems to have been one of the things that made a difference. Armor breaks from the outset looked like they were pretty equal. In fact, Matteo's Necro inflicted a lot of KOs. Uh, so, yeah, will KOs come back? And let's see, did KOs come back? Yeah, they came back mostly. Which is a bit more than the Green Dream will definitely stay out if they don't regen. And I don't think it counts regions in that number. While. Well, no, the chaos, you know, chaos came back from both sides. Um, I, I would like to say numbers could generally be kept quite close. Um, but I think Crepsley Mahal has a more of a bench. So it wasn't like the bash game was insanely weighted to one side. What it very much looks like is key moments could be exploited by Crepsley, who had that Ash Wolf. Um, and. Just gave a really tough time to Mattia, so I think we predicted definitely that I would give the Necro team of Crepslin more of the advantage because of how beat up Matthew's team is. Three nil still impressed the five away. Uh, well done to Crepslin. That was game week four. Um, some pretty impressive results there, as we as we all agree. We now move on to looking at teams, and again, we won't be looking at teams that have no level ups, but quite a few teams have level ups. Crepsilum's team definitely has a level up, because he leveled up, in that game, his white. His mighty low white now has piling on, which really helps the damage output quite a bit. Um, gives you an extra bite of the cherry. Obviously, you have to be kind of careful with the six movement, eight armor in piling on, but you'll be pretty happy with that. Uh, because Pylon can definitely, in certain cases, and certain matchups, just really do a lot in pushing a bunch of injuries, or a bunch of KOs into injuries, a bunch of stuns into KOs, giving you an advantage that kind of become very snowball against certain teams. I would really value Pylon against something like, say, Chorks, because there is a chance that you would remove a blocker or move a, a centaur and really make them scream uh, for a few games, for the whole turns afterwards, potentially the whole game if they don't aho it or it doesn't come back. Matthew's team also got a level up in the, in the form of getting a wrestle ghoul. Uh, I very much like this. The one problem that he has is he has no Saka. His whites aren't built for that. His uh, werewolf isn't built for that, really. Um, the, only, the only tackle he had on his thing, so the only way he could get down a blodge piece, 
was a zombie, and zombies moving four movement, yeah, not so good, mate. But the Wrestle Ghoul is a good pickup. It gives him a bit of versatility where he really needs it. So yeah, quite happy with this. Uh, quite happy with this pick at all. But we now look at the Chaos Dwarf team. The Chaos Dwarf team didn't pick up anything, I don't think, in terms of actual level ups. But oh my god, did something happen? <laughs> um, yeah, so, it is game against the Dark Elves. An MG on the blocker, but more importantly, the insane 7 movement, 5 strength full, took an armor bust. Meaning, that is a lot less invincible than it once was. And I'll tell you what that took an armor bust to. Funnily enough, uh, Wraith Guard managed to roll the 10 needed on a stab to the armor break it. And I believe it was like either niggled into armor bust or dead into armor bust. I think that was the uh, the story that Riff Cannon told. Maybe he used his uh, maybe he used his apo somewhere else, and they just had to just eat that. But that's a pretty horrific casualty to take. Um, I th I think the ball centaur that has the break tackle, the might blow, the tackle, is all in all the better piece. Because this is just like a, a fast big guy with block. Scary, but this has much more utility. But this is still a massive, massive loss for either the next game week, or potentially completely for the team. Um, whoever gets to play him will be quite happy in the knowledge that as long as they don't give way too much in terms of uh, too much in the terms of inducements, they're playing a team that has only one really versatile fast piece. And then has to expose more of the hobgoblins, which is very sad. He still has a complete wall of guard, so it's not like he'll struggle next week. It is, however, there are two really, really good pieces out, and essentially whoever plays them, I think, is being softballed, potentially. Uh, Masterful did pick up something, I think. We're going to check on the old rebel.net that we have at our... at our service right now. I think he leveled up. Yep, he leveled up a date for the skeleton. Who managed to roll the double for Sneaky Get? <laughs> Congratulations. Well done. Sneaky Get, a lot of people don't like it. Sneaky Get and Dirty Player, well, you know, why not take it? I think it's quite fun. It means you can just one assist or no assist foul for days and if it works, fucking brilliant. If it doesn't work, eh. You're not going to get sent off for it. Uh, this, the team, that's all the team has right now. In terms of level ups. Again, a solid Kenry team. A very solid Kenry team. The yeah, damage output that it has is amazing. Doubly so now that it has the player and Sneaky Git Skillington. Yeah, Masterful doing a good job there. And the poor Norse also got a level up. They also lost some really important pieces. Um... I believe that the dirty player rolled guard, which is good. Ish. The you know, obviously dirty player wasted skill, but it's blocked guard, so even though it's busted, it's, it's like still has a service, still has a use. The biggest issue though here was a edge up piling on mighty blow berserker died, which is very very sad. A really integral part of his damage output is gone, and block mighty blow yeti is gone. Not Yeti, Alphana, which is also very, very sad. He lost one of his important four strength pieces, and he lost another one of his important strength axis pieces that also was a big part of his um, stat freak Norse build. I, I think T. Cold will really feel better that he's had to rebuild at this halfway point in the season, coming up to halfway point in the season. My advice for T. Cold would be um, don't give mighty blow to the this old this new old furna block guard guard block either way um yeah that's all that's all i would say he still has the the chance of getting the piling on on this berserker building a new berserker and the new berserker will come along quite quickly if he focuses on it so it's not too horrible but it's still a bit of blow my my commiseration for taking there 
Disorient had an absolute stormer of a game this week. And it's translated in terms of SPP. He's picked up Hell Mary Pass on the... Uh, <laughs> Hell Mary Pass on the thrower. I don't know about that one, Chief, but fair play. It, I can see it having a value. Uh, Vanilla Mice is, a, I think, a new one as well. Let's look. Let's look at the Rebel.net things. Yep, Vanilla Mice is also an Anshop Guy Runner. Terrifying. Uh, a great pickup. Garden Storm Vermin Slave Z 2. And I believe Kanye Pest with Sysip is new as well. Unfortunately, the Halflings didn't manage to leave their mark as they are want to do. Move down in the Rat Ogre. With Block, I think it's still probably useful to keep around, but now that is definitely in the territory of getting rid of it because Rat Ogre I don't think is very good. Six movement makes it kind of okay, but five movement, you know, I'm not sure about that, Chief. When this gets Mighty Blow, when a Mushroom Splatter gets Mighty Blow, I would very much consider removing that altogether and potentially, I don't know, replacing ASAP Rocket as well. Because that Buster Go Runner can become something entirely different. But if you level Vanilla, I would say if you level Vanilla Mice, get him his protection. Then ASAP Rocket is in pole position to get removed from the team. But once again, the fantastic team. You saw rebuilding season and rebuilding project is going fantastic. And with his run of results as well. Pretty impressive. He's, he's shown himself to be a potential dark force. Uh, and also got revenge for the 4-2 loss he took in uh, the open invitational. So, <laughs> congratulations to Zarin. Um, no level ups from Helgen. And he didn't take anything in terms of uh, casualties. I am in GD Wrestle, I think. Wrestle Rotter was MNG'd. So, we unfortunately, won't cover Helgen. Uh, I believe Gunnerside got a level up. Let's look. I love Rebel.net so much for this. Yeah, he got his catcher with Strip Ball leveled. And let's see what he got. He got Leap. Yep. Yep. Uh, nothing at all sort of questionable about that. That's a good pickup. Now he has a really good Saka. Any cage that faces him will be right to be terrified. Otherwise, it hasn't really progressed at all. Good team. And I believe with the record of four wins, yeah, four wins thus far on the season, um, the High Elves have shown themselves to be fantastic. My guys didn't get any level ups. So we'll ignore the underworld. They took an MG to a two heads wrestle gob uh, not goblin. Mine rat. So anyone who is playing me next week, that's Plovac. Plovac plays me, yeah. You that's all you have to factor into your plan. I, I lost I lost one piece. Bungieman, I believe, got a level up. I might be wrong. Hold on. Um Week four. Yeah, yeah, but he got two level ups. And on quite good pieces as well, thank god. He now has Moy Block on the on Stern Treeman. The worst thing in the world. I, I still would take grab. Catch on the edge up halfling is a damn good pickup. Because, you know, the one turn throw is much, much better. Uh yeah. I, I prefer grab on stern. I, you know, but then again, I'm not the halfling coach. I don't play halflings. But those are two good uh, pickups to have in the game week, even if the game that he played was brutal. So, good job, halflings. Now, the lizards. I believe more Plovac took. He didn't get anything. So, unfortunately, Plovac won't be covering your team. Uh, you picked up nothing. Bear luck's next week, I guess. Wheelie picked up something with his pro elves. His thrower got a level up, which is 
a good thing. And he gave the thrower sheer feet. Not the worst thing in the world, with the frankly average movement that a thrower has on the on the Pro Evolve team. It means that he is more able to push all of his squares and make sure he turns certain throws into, say, from a long bomb to a short pass without worrying about getting rid of the reroll. Uh, he almost has all four of his catches at least with protection on them. His blitzes are still kind of looking a little bit way too bare in my opinion. He needs those to get dodge as soon as he can. But, yeah. Pretty good development. Should've, I, I'm not sure if I would have taken something like block still with the thrower, just because I like to have him be either useful on the offense if I have to, or the defense rather if I have to field him, or give him the protection against sacks, but Shuffy otherwise is an inspired choice, I kind of like it. Now I believe Wraithguard now got some level ups. Or maybe this was a case of he got lots of level, he got lots of SPP on things that don't level up. Yep, yeah, that's true. So he, he lost his runner, his runner died and got, had to get replaced. As they die, he got shrunk down. And the Blitzer managed to get 14 SVP in the game. So he's very close to rolling his next skill. Which looks to be Tackle. Could be... If, if he gets something like an Edge Up or he gets something like another movement up. Brilliant, brilliant work. Uh, as we know, usually I've been saying every game week we should fire the Assassin. Because the Assassin's useless. It's a bad piece. Considering it now armored down a bull, I can't say that anymore. Uh... The assassin is an inspired choice, so you have to keep it. It's <laughs> armoring down a ball somehow. The assassin. It will. It, it, he lives up to his name of Mr. Funny Fun Fun. Well done, Wraith Guard. Uh, you have my approval. And the last is GFI Joe, who I believe was one of the people we weren't going to be covering this week because he didn't get anything. Yeah, no, he got. You know, he got stuff. Okay, well, uh, blow me down. GFI Joe got Adjust up on a Pestagore on the Blodge Pestagore. Fantastic pickup. The best thing he possibly could have picked up, I think, bar nothing else. Um, that is now a star player. If he can get if he can get a move up, it would just be insanely good. Uh, I just say, just get a move up. And one of the Nurgle Warriors got a level up. Thorny guy, I think. Yeah, Thorny guy got a level up, so he got guard. Now this team is looking a lot more like it's uh, like Helgen's team. It's still a little bit behind. It doesn't have its claw pom online, but it's getting the, the, the warriors are getting something. It's getting there, uh, and for a team that's sort of quite a bit younger than Helgen's, GFI Joe must be happy with how this is going. Because I, if I was you, GFI Joe, I would be very pleased with how this team is developing. Impressive pickup. Um, good luck for next game week, I'd say, because you can go into any game that you play with a lot more confidence that you'll score and that you'll potentially win or get a result out of it. So those were the games. The teams, rather. And those were the games at game week four. We now have the prediction corner coming up. Uh, speaking of GFI Joe, he plays the halflings for his game this week. And, yeah, my prediction, although there is a complete lack of tackle on GFI Joe's team, the Mighty Blow Press score can easily get three dies. Um, half things aren't too fast. Disturbing Presence will make any sort of throw from the Treeman really, really, really hard. Uh, I really don't see the half things have much of a chance here. So I would say, I'm not going to say what well, margin, because that's always like, you never know with Halfling. But I will say I would solidly predict a victory for GFI Joe. Next up is the Underworld versus the Lizardman. So that's me. Uh, obviously don't like doing my own predictions, because uh, otherwise I'm kind of like <laughs> biased, obviously. But I think I could get a result out of this. A lot of the TV of Plovac's team is tied up in its skinks. Well, I have three wrestle and two tackle, so I'm not too scared of getting them down. I have the, the boots then to stomp on them. 
and the Saurus aren't as developed as they could be. Obviously, because this team is comparatively younger than a lot of the teams in the actual division. But we've only blocked on a bunch of things. It's very easy for me just to snipe either Skinks because I have the tackle, or snipe Sauruses because I have the Claw Mighty Blow piling on. Even the Fowling Game element to it. I would like to say that the natural result of this could be a 1-1. Obviously, Plyback could do what he did to T-Cold and just cancel the nonsense out of him. But I can do the same thing, but with more certainty. Because I do get two bites of the cherry if I ever get one of the Saurus down, for example. Uh, no clear prediction, but 1-1 one, one is like in my mind. Next, we have an Elf off with the Pro Elves versus the Sunbake Sea Guard. Um... This is a tough game to call. There is a bit more development on the high elf team, but the high elf team gives up a wizard, which is massive. Uh, although it's only it's an elf off, so a wizard's are always hard to use against elves. The thing is, is that both elf teams move kind of slow. I say kind of slow; it's not like horrifically slow. But if we look at the um, sunbaked sea guard briefly. He only has. Four pieces above seven movement. Seven movement and above, rather. Which always is a bit of a pain in the ass to deal with. He can be wizarded. If the. That's. Because they, they, the, the Pro Elves now have six above seven movement pieces. Seven movement above pieces. So they absolutely can just chase down the ball and then force the risky ish plays. And have essentially people covering both sides of the field. So no matter where the ball goes, a, a bolt is always there for the steal. And you can cover a lot of ground. I, I love the offensive the offensive prowess of the Pro Elves. A lot more than the High Elves. And the way that they're giving up 300, I think, in terms of inducements in that game week. I'm going to be quite bold here and say, although the, the High Elf team is better developed... I'm played by a really good coach, of course, so I'm sure that Gunside won't give up too much. Uh, the Wizard, for me, and the uh, complete speed of the Pro Elves in comparison make me think this is going to turn out to be a, a victory for the Pro Elves. That's my prediction. Prove me wrong. Then we have Nurgle versus Dark Elves. After the stunning victory of Wraithguard against the Chorfs, you can't really look past them anymore. You can definitely do a dirty on pretty much any team. Nurgle is tough, but the fact is is that Nurgle don't really have too much in the way of tackle. So any dodge piece, any blodge piece on that team, it's not a lot, but they exist. Let's look at the, the team briefly again. Two blodge means that there are players, and this star player especially, that the, the Nurgle will struggle to deal with. Not as, as uniform as some Dark Elf teams might be. But also, they get Wizard. Whoops. I, I left, the, uh, left the vision there. But with the Wizard as well, considering how slow Nurgle move, there's always a possibility for a 1-0 or a 2-1 or a 2-0 in favour of the Dark Elves. Because they can pop that Wizard at any time and essentially just stop a score. As long as they are smart, their positioning... To always leave an avenue open so the ball, when it bounces after a lightning bolt, doesn't just end up amongst a million billion Nurgle players on the screen. So it's just simple, much of free plusing every time. Um, so I will be bold and say Dark Elves, I think, also have this. Nothing against the Helgen. Great coach as well. But I just still think that an elf team with a wizard against Nurgle is, is worth its weight in gold. Um, as we saw in the playoffs last season um, then we have the necromantic this is Krepslum's necromantic versus the rapscallywags the siren skaven tough game to call uh, with a bunch of a bunch of new things online for the skaven this can really go either way and both teams aren't giving up any terms of inducement so there's no wizard option here this is one of the really hard ones to call uh, Krepslim's a great coach. Usarian's a really great coach. Hmm. 
I'm going to say the Skaven, though, have a slight advantage because Crypton's team is amazing partially because of the um, nine movement for Edge Wolf. But obviously the Skaven have a bunch of nine movement and four edge. So the offensive prowess of the Skaven is slightly better. The mighty blow piling on the mighty blow tackle could have caused Kaz the Skaven to nonsense and to buggery. That can always happen. Um, and without claw mighty blow, just just having claw, which isn't by itself that good, you saw everyone struggle to get anything in terms of numbers. The Rat Ogre being out is a real shame. But I'm still going to say it's looking like a Skaven victory. I just always fancy Skaven. I also I also always fancy Usari in a lot of cases. Uh, then we have Matthew's Necro versus t -Cold's Norse. And despite the beating that t -Cold took, I still think that he has a decent chance against Matthew's team. A complete lack of mighty blow means maybe this will be a game that t -Cold instead finally does all the casualties and does all the damage. You never know. Um, does give away like a wizard and something else. Bribe a babe, maybe. Which is always going to be tough. But the amount of agility on the team, the amount of strength, the amount of still mighty blow. Claw mighty blow at that means that I'm going to tip T Cold to, to finally win a game uh, this season. I think he's long overdue. And I wish him all the best of luck. Not just because he's G Man 10A boy because I do believe that he's had an unfortunate season, especially in the last game week. And now we have a vicious matchup between two of the most deadly teams in the division, um, being the Kemri versus the Chorps. A very hard game to call. The fact that there is a Bull Centaur out and also a um, just a guard Chorps blocker out means I have to say I'm tipping for Kemri to win this one. The Chorves do get some inducements, probably amounting to a wizard-ish, maybe two bribes instead, depends on what uh, Rift Cannon's priorities are. But if I had to make a prediction, I would say the Kemri can lean on the Chorves way more. Of course, Chorps can just hit with Claw Mighty Blow. They have that power due to Sparks, the insane blocker. But I think there'll be a lot of situations and scenarios where Rift Cannon's sitting there being like, I can't even get the one dice on any of these things. So if you had to ask me, very much going to tap the Camry to win here. Uh, which, if that does happen, really puts the cat on the pigeons in terms of the leaderboard. And a lot of our predictions for the first game week of where, where we would be in these three or five games of time kind of get turned up on its head a little bit. Not too much, but definitely the balls would have looked a little different than what we imagined them to be. And with that is the end of the predictions and the end of the show. Uh, this has been a quite quick one, I think. No, relatively. Let, let's finish it up before it hits 40 minutes so I feel better about myself. Um, anyway, thanks for listening in. Yes, we'll have a new co-host next week. We promise that. I'm going to shove this into the encoder while I get ready to go off to uh, a trip. So that's why it's also kind of hurried and rushed. Uh, this has been Chug Man Milk. I hope you have a fruitful and fortunate game week this week, especially if you were someone who got diced last week. Looking at UT Cold. Um, best of luck to everyone. Uh, and I will see you for the next recap this time next week, maybe. So it's Chug Man Milk signing off. Have a good one.